Hey guys, my name is Guillermo Samarripa, founder and CEO at the Market in Jersey, and you're listening to BS Podcast. Hola amigos de Pancho Villas Army, el sargento aquí de nuevo con otro episodio de Villas Podcast. This podcast is actually going to be a unique one uh, because we're going to do it both in Espanol y en inglés. So whatever happens, whatever we decide to feel comfortable with, we're going to go with it. And for me, um, you know, I have the pleasure of having two uh, awesome co-hosts. As we know always, I have Ivan this time. He is not working. We got him out of La Chamba. Ivan, ¿cómo estás? Bien, bien, gracias a Dios. He's here. Enjoying Sunday and a uh, podcast with you guys. So podcast con nosotros. Gracias. Y luego tenemos, tenemos a Sergio. Sergio, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien. ¿Cómo están todos? Here hanging out with you guys. Just gonna talk soccer, man. What more do we want on a Sunday afternoon? That's what I'm yeah. saying, man. And if you guys haven't noticed, Sergio is actually in his daycare uh, facility right now. If you see a lot of the pictures <laughs> in the background. If we start to see some kids, you know, running back and forth, that's his, that's his third job. He's got, like, actually many jobs, so that's what I've been saying. Those are actually my pictures. What are you trying to say, man? <laughs> I'm saying you're an artist, bro. You're missing your calling. Uh, but enough of us, man. You know what? It's, this is why we don't have, you know, Via's podcast is not about us. It's about our members. It's about our soccer society, uh, super fans, just soccer in general. And as we know here in Villa, we enjoy a good conversation. So here today with us, we have Guillermo Samaripa. Guillermo, ¿cómo estás? And, and you know, it's uh, it was it's fun branching out to try to not just get members only. We want to start getting to know the soccer community, right? Um, and, and I thought, you know, what better way than reaching out to Guillermo? And I've been seeing a lot of movement happening in what you're doing. Um, so thank you for joining us, man. We can't wait to to dive in and get to know your story, man. Thank you. I'm a big fan of what you guys do. Uh, you know, I've known for many, many years, and. Uh, passionate about BS Army, so I'm um, happy to be here with you guys. Thank you, thank you. So let's start off with getting to know you. Un poquito de usted, Guillermo. Um, dinos un poco de tu historia. Um, de dónde vienes, dónde naciste, dónde te creas. Todo, todo, todo lo que quieras, por favor. Perfecto. A ver, um, voy a intentar a little bit Spanish here, but um, a ver, soy original de Tampico, Tamaulipas. Este, yo nací, crecí en Tampico. Mi familia, de hecho, sigue estando allá. Eh, tuve la fortuna de, eh, de crecer con, con, con mis padres, eh, con mis hermanas, en un pueblo muy, muy pequeño de Tamaulipas. Siempre un poco con, con el fútbol en, en mente, ¿no? con la selección mexicana. Eh, pues como cualquier mexicano varón eh, en nuestro país, eh, creciendo con la ilusión de, de jugar profesional. ¿no? Eh, así, con esa mentalidad, digamos, fui, fui creciendo, fui jugando fútbol en diferentes categorías. Eh, ya la edad por ahí de 14, 15 años, tuve mi primera oportunidad de, no de jugar profesional, sino ya de, digamos, da, dar el brinco a, a jugar fútbol de manera seria. Entonces, de Tampico me, me visorearon de Pumas, eh, Memo Vázquez eh, Jr. Eh, voy a México, hago la prueba. Este, yo a esa edad pues, estaba muy pequeño eh, y recuerdo perfectamente que mi, lo primero que me dijo mi padre es, si te quieres ir, eh, lo primero que tienes que hacer es asegurarte que vas a poder seguir estudiando. Entonces, desde ahí tuve mi primer mi primer encuentro, digamos, con el estudio, con, con, con esa mentalidad eh, un poco, digamos, fundamentada de mi familia, de decir, cu cualquier cosa que hagas, tienes que tener la educación en mente. Eh, obviamente, a mi edad, pues yo lo que quería era jugar fútbol, o sea, en, en ese momento la educación no, no me importaba, pero pues, sabía que tenía que estudiar para irme a México, pues, decidí obviamente enrolarme, encontrar una secundaria, eh, y tomo ese reto de irme a la Ciudad de México a jugar eh, en aquel momento Fuerzas Básicas Sub-15. Eh, estoy un par de años eh, ya en, en México eh, y luego regreso a, a mi tierra ya a jugar Segunda División eh, y Primera División A con, con la Jaiba Brava y con Estudiantes de Altamira. Eh, mi carrera, como muchas de, de, de muchos futbolistas, realmente nunca di el brinco a, 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 digamos, a jugar eh, Primera División, eh, pero tuve la fortuna de en el camino conocer a personas que me fueron guiando y en alguno de esos torneos internacionales eh, con Pumas eh, recuerdo que me entra un poco la idea de explorar, porque en aquel momento no sabía ni qué era 
en, en la liga colegial americana, ¿no? Uno crece en México muy alejado de, de lo que viene siendo la infraestructura de la NCAA ni, ni cómo funciona. Eh, pero bueno, con un poco de, de asesoría y, y, a, y apoyo de diferentes amigos y una empresa un poco que me dice, mira, con tu talento, con lo que has hecho a nivel México, pues puedes conseguir una beca deportiva. Y, y en aquel momento yo lo que hice fue, eh, recuerdo perfectamente grabar eh, un video, grabándome guardique, algunas jugadas, algún material de, de partidos que encontré. Eh, empiezo a hacer contacto con las universidades y para mi sorpresa... Eh, a los dos, tres días tenía ya como 30 universidades interesadas en, en mí. Wow. Y ahí es cuando, siempre he dicho, a mí me cambia la vida, porque de, de tener mi, mi, un camino que era muy, muy, digamos, muy lineal, de decir, era, o jugar primera división, o a ver qué haces, ¿no? En México, a ver, encuentras otro trabajo, encuentras una, una carrera que te guste. No tenía plan B. El plan B para mí llega cuando se me presenta la oportunidad de emigrar a Estados Unidos como student athlete, y de ahí, bueno se viene todo lo demás, ¿no? Wow, pues qué, qué padre. Yo sé que muchos, you know, a lot of us have um, dreamed about, you know, either work, playing, you know, semi-pro yeah. or, you know, go, go and getting a scholarship to a university are things that are, a lot of, a lot of our young soldados and, um, are probably looking at right now. A lot of, uh, you know, our soldados' kids are going to school, están jugando, están, quieren, tienen la ilusión que sean jugadores profesionales, pero me gusta lo que dijo tus papás, right? Your parents said, It's not about just the game. I want you to get your education. So it's got to be that balance, man. I know Sergio is a, a, young, a young father. He's got uh, two boys. Sergio, what, what is your philosophy on that, man? Because, uh, you know, what, what is your future for your boys? What are you going to do when you get to that 15, they're 14, 15 years old, and they want to be, be, be professionals? No, no. The first thing I'm going to do is call Guillermo and, and, and make sure he's not one of his obviously. Uh, between Guillermo and my wife, they keep me grounded. But I, I think what's, what's really cool about Guillermo's story Um, is that now he takes his story as a, as a road path for other athletes. Yeah. You know? um, not every athlete can make it professionally what, in whatever sport, right? Um, and Guillermo can, can go to, 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 to athletes and be like, look, you know, professional or not professional, your education is important. I'm yeah. a perfect example of it. Um, you know, and then I can guide you because when he did it, there really wasn't this, this – this mentorship program that Guillermo has kind of developed through his agency now. Right. Um, and so that's what I think is like really key. Um, what Guillermo brings to the table for, for some of these kids that have no idea about the, like you said, the NCAA environment uh, is just crazy. It's just, it's, it's awesome to see a lot of our young Latino kids getting the, those opportunities here in the U S and, and a lot of it's yeah. guys like Guillermo. Really. I think he's the only guy I've ever seen that instead of trying to push you into a professional slot automatically, If you're not ready, you know, there's other avenues that are very beneficial to you. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. And that's what I love about this, you know, especially the U.S., right? You're, you're, you have an idea, you see a, there's a gap or there's, there's something that's lacking and you have an idea. The fact that Yermo just took this and just ran with it, man. And I know that, um, Ivan, you know, you're, you're a teacher, right? So you're dealing with a lot, high school, is it high school? So you're dealing yeah, with a lot of these kids, man. Don't even know what they want to do. They're just, you yeah. know, they're thinking, and it's just, it's difficult to talk to a 14, 15 year old no, and sí. tell them, hey, you know. Mm -hmm. Y algo clave que dijo Guillermo, que siempre me enfocó también mi mamá y papá, es que tengamos como plan A y B, pero siempre algo clave que ellos nos ayudaron con fue en educación. So, por ejemplo, yo cuando graduó de la high school, todavía no sabía qué quería hacer para mi carrera. Uh, pero gracias a Dios, agarré mi primer posición de asistente de maestro en una escuela como dos millas de aquí. Se llama Hollenbeck Middle School, right here in Boyle Heights. Okay. Y me empecé a juntar con diferentes maestros, iba a las juntas. So, la verdad, sí fue más o menos cuando decidí hacer maestro. Pero ayudó, eso ayudó como influencia como a mi hermana. So, yeah. ya poco, poco, poco. Ya, ya este año apenas graduó de Cal State LA y agarró su maestría en inglés. Pero es algo yeah. que siempre uh -huh. uh, nuestros padres han enfocado en nosotros, la educación. De, de, uh, vamos a hacer lo que vamos a hacer como para disfrutar la vida, pero siempre, yeah. siempre estamos detrás de nosotros para que nos enfocamos en la educación también. Yeah. So, Guillermo, what did you get your degree in? What did you end up going to school for when you took advantage of that scholarship? So, um, funny story, like when, when, I, when I started being recruited, I had uh, Penn State, I had UNC, Chapel Hill, had San Diego. Wow. Uh, I have very good universities, right? So knowing what I know now, I would have gone to one of those. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> Don't tell that to your alumni. <laughs> I know. No, but I, I always tell that story because it, it's true. It, it's a fact. I, I wasn't, I was completely ignorant when it comes to how NCAA worked, right? So I was already in college in Mexico. I was already uh, in my second year in college. So I, was, I guess sophomore, right? So what what I focus on, focus on was what school is going to transfer all of my credits so that I could play two years and graduate in two years, right? Because when I started looking at the transfer credits for Penn State and San Jones and UNC, my Texas de Monterrey um, credits, which were good school for Mexico, they weren't transferable to those business schools. So what oh. the coaches were telling me was, hey, you can come, you're going to have a scholarship for two years, and then you're going to have to figure out the rest, like the, the next year, the next two years, in order to graduate. So here it is, a you know, 19-year-old kid, not knowing any, any of the rules. My parents didn't know uh, any either. So I went, I, I took the safe, the safe, safe route, right? Which was, what school can give me my 48 credits from Tecno Monterrey, completely transferred, uh, and that was NYIT in New York. Uh, it was a Division two schools. So, uh, again, knowing what I know now, I would have gone D- D1 and playing those big schools because, uh, you know, once you're enrolled in that kind of university, you'll figure it out what to do for the, yeah. for, for the next yeah. year, year and a half that you have to graduate. Whether it's assistantships, whether it's, you know, working on campus, there's 10 different routes that you could take in order yeah. to graduate. I didn't know that, so I just took the same route and said, you know what, whatever university gives me the uh, 100% guarantee that I was going to graduate. Um, I ended up going to New York to study international business, um, and that's why I did two years, graduated, and uh, started working. Which, by the way, at, at that point, that, w- that was my goal. When I, cre- when I came to the States, uh, I had a very clear goal in mind, which was find a job. Don't come back to <laughs> So see. <laughs> I was. Yeah. <laughs> I already had two surgeries playing soccer. Uh, I knew I was. I wasn't gonna continue playing uh, at a top level. I was good enough to get a, a, a full ride scholarship, but I wasn't good enough to continue to, you know, to, to to develop that soccer career. So that was my goal. And I at that point I didn't even care in, in what in what. Like it could be working in marketing operations. I didn't care. I just wanted to find a job to yeah. not return to Mexico. That was literally my my, my goal. Nice. I like that. And, and you know what? Here you are, man. You know, uh, how long ago has that been now? Was that last year? <laughs> <laughs> so when I came here was 2007. So I was in NYIT from 2007 to 2009, um, right in the middle of the financial crisis, uh, which was 10 times harder to get a job. Uh, yeah. But I, I ended up getting a job in fintech um, for a company called Broadridge Financial Solutions. And I worked there for many, many years, and I still do. I still, I still work in that organization, which a lot of people don't don't know. Like a lot of people, they just know me because of the marketing year scene and CMA as athletes, uh, but they don't know the, the the fintech story as well. Well, and you got a you got a master's as well, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, in, in my journey, uh, when I graduated in two thousand nine, um, I guess go, going into my agencies, I started working with Broadridge in New York. Uh, I did that for six straight years. During those six years, I grew up my first business called CMAS Athletes, uh, which is what Sergio was referring to earlier in terms of is this consulting model uh, for student athletes around the world that want to pursue uh, athletic scholarship here in the States. Similar to what I did, right? I had no clue. I didn't have access to information. So I built a model that would explain kids uh, around the world again, how, what do they need to do in order to be eligible to play NAIA, junior college, NCAA, uh, what do they need to do to be, uh, you know, to present themselves to college coaches? You know, what 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 does a D1 coach looks for? Um, and then uh, that company uh, still still operates from Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, have six six people working full time in that organization right now. Um, and then that opened the route to my second business, which is a marketing jersey. Now, somewhere in the middle, to what was was saying, I I found time to do two masters. I did a master's in sports business uh, at SMU and an MBA from TCU. So that's one story short uh, my my journey throughout these almost fourteen years. That that's an amazing journey. Get you know, there's a you know, siendo un atleta en México, 
ganar una, una beca ¿verdad? para jugar en, en Estados Unidos, en New York. Pero, pero realmente, New York, I mean, ¿qué, ¿quién no quiere jugar en New York? ¿Qué importa la escuela? I mean, yeah. Es New York, man. Yo, you know, la verdad, yo fui a New York por la primera vez este año pasado, en 2019. La primera vez que he ido a New York, y fue rápido. Fue, you know, avión a, a West Point. Uh, a, a entrenar y para atrás al aeropuerto y regresar. Es as far as New York I got to see, my friend. So yeah. the fact that you got to see, you know, you went to school in New York, that's amazing, man. So I think that, I mean, I imagine you, you wouldn't trade that for the world, that experience of getting to know that big city. Uh, pero, you know, tu, tu journey ha sido fenomenal, man. You know, yo, yo pienso que muchos este, atletas jóvenes ahí tienen, tienen esa desilusión, esa esperanza de un día ser profesional, pero también no pares ahí. Hay mucha, hay mucha, toma ventaja de la oportunidad que tienes. Yeah, tengo la ventaja de, de, la, de la escuela de educación, uh, pero es difícil a esa edad, es difícil. So, para un atleta joven que quiere, quiere ir, uh, tiene la ilusión de ir a NCAA o any of these colleges in the U.S., what is your, your first recommendation for them? What do you recommend them to do first? What, what, what is like the biggest tips that you have for them? Uh, start with time. You know, there's, the first thing is uh, understanding the complexity and the structure that the NCAA has, right? I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I, we talk uh, with a lot of kids that have tremendous talent in Mexico. Uh, I was one of them 14 years ago. But the first thing that, you know, Mexican players think of, like, you know, when you look at Fuerza Básica de Tigres, de Monterrey, de Pachuca, all of those kids are extremely talented. But there's still that mindset that just because they are in Fuerza Básicas, they're going to come and dominate Division One. That is not the case. Division one is extremely competitive. There are hundreds of nationalities all over the different, you know, all, all over the country. Uh, when you're in, in a team like, like those, like Wake Forest and UNC and San Jones, it's almost like a Primera División A in Mexico. And people don't understand that. It's that competitive. Uh, and then structures in the facilities are even better than professional clubs in Mexico and in Europe. That's a fact. Like, if you go to one of those big, big, big schools, you're flying in charter. That doesn't happen in Pachuca or in Monterrey or in America. You travel in, in, in bus, you know, from one city to another. Uh, those are just facts. And you're in ESPN and you have, you know, a, I don't know, backs and backs of, like, apparel that they're going to give you. And you're going to be training. You're going to have a nutritionist, psicólogo, you know, personas que graban video. I mean, the structure that the NCAA has at that level It cannot be replicated in professional soccer in, in, in Mexico. And, and that's what I think, um, that's the first hurdle, is people understanding that playing Division One is not much faster. I mean, you're not going to be there just because you're talented. And by the way, those schools have stricter requirements from an admissions perspective, TOEFL perspective, SAT. You're competing, you're competing against people worldwide in order just to be in a 24 roster team. So that's why you don't see a lot of talented uh, Mexican players going to the NCAA because, one, they don't have the mindset of preparing, right? When they realize that, they, oh, you know what, maybe I want to do this, it's too late. You know, that happens when they're already uh, past high school or in their last year of high school. And in that short time frame, you're not going to prepare for SATs, for TOEFL. You're done. You know, your route is going junior college, NIA, or maybe a lower division one school, Um, which again, it diminishes the, the kind of big opportunities that you could get if you start with time. Um, you know, the, the contrast there is on the, on the women's side, we see a lot of uh, women soccer players starting earlier. And I think that's, that, that's the reason why you see a lot of more Mexican players uh, or international players in general competing at the Division I level. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think the one, number one recommendation is understanding the, the system Uh, three, four years earlier and start three, four years earlier. It, it, you know, cuando tienes ya, cuando te falta un año o te faltan seis meses, es muy tarde. Y esa es un poco la, la mentalidad que, que, que existe en nuestros países. Y digo países porque no solamente México, nos, nos toca el, el mismo proceso con Venezuela, con España, con Argentina. Cuando, los chicos cuando van, se van bachillerato, empiezan a ver sus opciones de universidad cuando les quedan seis meses o doce meses. Es, así funciona en nuestros países. Sí. Y acá es totalmente a la inversa. Desde 3, 4 años antes ya tienes una idea de qué universidad quieres ir. Y si eres sí. muy bueno, ya tienes ofertas. Bueno, Guillermo, y pregunta. Uh, si yo me acuerdo bien, Fernando Redondo 
fue al colegio universitario en Estados Unidos y luego regresó al Real Madrid. ¿Es el colegio, el, el fútbol colegial, una plataforma para, para el fútbol masculino para llegar a profesional o, o más no? Excelente pregunta, Sergio. Yo, mira, en varonil no, todavía no. O sea, el, varonil, el varonil no. Cuando eres, eh, cuando tienes la oportunidad de ser Messi o cuando tienes la oportunidad de ser Neymar, cuando tienes, o sea, no, eh, te va a convenir mil veces más quedarte en las fuerzas básicas de Barcelona, de Real Madrid, porque a la edad de 17, 18 años ya estás ganando mucho dinero. Entonces, pero es, es ese porcentaje que tiene el potencial de llegar. Es ahí donde muchos se pierden, ¿no? O sea, ¿cuántos realmente tienen la capacidad y el talento para realmente llegar y cuántos no? Los que no llegan, claro, una plataforma como la NCAA es un, es un sistema envidiable y que te puede ayudar a seguir creciendo y en algunos casos a brincar al profesionalismo vía el draft. Eh, eso es la parte varonil. En la parte femenil no hay duda que el, la NCAA es un semillero para el profesionalismo y no hay duda de que les conviene a las jugadoras eh, por el tema de salarios. Digo, el, el mejor caso ahí que, que tengo, eh, que ha pasado de, de una agencia a la otra, es de Ina Castellanos, venezolana, que a la edad de 14, 15 años ya era una figura mundial, ya tenía ofertas de Europa. Eh, y cuando hicimos el análisis hace 4 o 5 años, eh, nos dimos cuenta que a, a Deina, en cuanto a crecimiento y en cuanto a futuro, le convenía la NSWA. Olvídate del Barcelona, del PSG, del Lyon ahorita. Eso va a llegar. Eh, lo que te conviene es una educación, lo que te conviene es tener un título, lo que te conviene es estar en un sistema donde te va a apoyar eh, y te va a proveer con las herramientas para que sigas creciendo como futbolista. Y cuando te gradúes, ya, ya, va, ya vas a tener esas oportunidades a nivel profesional. Y estamos hablando de una chica que dentro, una jugadora que dentro de su, de su carrera como colegial fue top 3 del mundo. O sea, yo me tocó ir con ella a los premios de Best en Londres, eh, con Carrie Lloyd, con Marta en la terna, eh, con Nicky Martins, perdón. Eh, o sea, a un jugador de ese calibre. Eso no pasa a los hombres. O sea, un, un hombre que está en esa terna es millonario. Y en el caso de las mujeres, no. Eh, estamos muy lejos todavía de eso, desafortunadamente. Sí. Y hablando de, de, you know, de, de women's, the women's league, the women's uh, soccer league, and women's path to you know, professionalism, um, I see that you have a big focus in that right now. I see a couple of jerseys in your back. I see Chadlene's jersey and all that. So tell me about, you know, your your current ventures right now. ¿Qué, qué es lo que estás haciendo ahorita para el fútbol femenino? ¿Qué es, ¿Cuáles son sus proyectos? ¿Qué es lo que estás haciendo? Excelente pregunta. Mira, yo la verdad es que siempre, cuando cuento la historia, es lo que hemos ido haciendo ha sido, eh, ha sido consecuencia de, de trabajo previo y, y ha sido consecuencia un poco de de una inversión ya de hace muchos, muchos años. Eh, cuando empezamos con la primera agencia, con Semas Athletes, el objetivo era traer a chicos a Estados Unidos becados. Eh, y es una empresa que al día de hoy ha ayudado a más de 400 chicos que están por todo Estados Unidos. Muchos de ellos ya se graduaron y se quedaron trabajando en Estados Unidos o regresaron a sus países. Y, y luego hay un porcentaje de, de jugadores de diferentes disciplinas que tienen talento para ir a jugar fútbol profesional. Uno de ellos, por ejemplo, fue Charlie Corral. Eh, a Char, yo la conozco ya hace mucho, mucho tiempo cuando estaba ella en el TEC de Monterrey, en México. Y vi a la primera agencia, Semas Athletes, le proponemos a Char, mira Char, con tu talento, con tu currículum, estamos hablando que a esa edad Charlin ya era Charlin Corral, o sea, ya tenía 3, 4 mundiales, ya era niño prodigio de la FIFA, eh, ya era una figura emblemática en nuestro país. Eh, y le propusimos llevarla en el proceso para que pudiera llegar a la MSWA. Eh, y, y termina ella, en, después de entrar al proceso, termina ella en Louisville University, eh, compitiendo con Division One. Está dos años, similar en mi caso, ya llevaba dos años de, de carrera, la transferimos y le quedan dos años en Louisville. Eh, cuando Char, y, y bueno, es un caso, por ejemplo, también de, de esas ganas, ¿no? De Char, de, no, hablaba, no hablaba nada de inglés, cero, nada. Entonces recuerdo perfectamente que una de las condiciones que utilizamos en la negociación con las universidades pues a una universidad que le pusiera un, 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 este, un mentor, alguien que le explicara las clases en español, después de que ocurrieran en inglés, porque si no, Charly al principio no se enteraba de nada. Eh, fíjate, dos años después de eso, se graduó con honores de la Universidad de Louisville, ya dominando totalmente el nivel de inglés. Ahí yo no tengo nada que ver, es simplemente poner la oportunidad en la mesa y, y la jugadora o la atleta es muchas veces quien realmente toma esa oportunidad y hace mucho con ella, ¿no? Charlene es, es, 
es el claro ejemplo de eso. Cuando Charlín se gradúa, eh, se me acerca la familia, hablamos con ella y nos, prácticamente nos dicen si nos podemos ayudar ya a nivel profesional. Ahí es cuando nace un poco la idea de, de, abri, de, de abrir otra agencia, porque ya a nivel profesional y a nivel amateur no, no los puedo combinar en la misma agencia que yo tenía corriendo, que era Hacia Más Athletes. Entonces fundo otra empresa, le digo a la familia, mira, no soy experto, en aquel momento no éramos expertos en el fútbol femenino, no éramos ni siquiera expertos en, en temas de representación, eh, pero les dijimos, mira, si ustedes están dispuestos a, a, a aventarse el paquete con nosotros, lo intentamos, and let's see what happens. Um, meses después, Charlene, Charlene Corral ya estaba firmada en, en, en Finlandia, con Merilapi United, y ahí nace The Marketing Jersey, la segunda agencia. Um, de ahí luego la pasamos a, a Levante y empiezan a venirse ciertas jugadoras, algunas de la, de, igual de Semas Athletes, que se graduaban, empiezan a brincar ya, como el caso de Berta Espinosa, que de Oregon State, ahora la mandamos a, eh, a Levante, Natalia Gómez Junco, eh, que de LSU luego salta al Málaga, eh, oh, en fin, wow. uno de esos ejemplos, Cristina Ferral de USF, salta al Olympique de Marsella, en Francia. Y, eh, bueno, Guillermo, Guillermo, real quick, para, para que la gente entienda, especialmente la, nuestra, la gente que nos sigue en México, yep. CIMAS Athletes es como guidance counselors, ¿verdad? Los de guidance counselors que tienes en high school que te ayudan a buscar colleges y todo eso. Pero ya de marketing jersey, es it's, it's an official um, agent. Agency, yeah. Because um, of the NCAA rules, ¿verdad? Correct, yes. Correct. ¿Cómo vamos a cambiar? Uh, That's, that makes sense. ¿Y cómo puede oh. beneficiar eso a un atleta mexicano o a un atleta uh, que está buscando ir al colegio primero? ¿Cómo, cómo puede beneficiar la, la, la primera agencia? Los cambios que están pasando en el NCAA ahorita para los atletas um, y cómo puede cambiar ese toda la dinámica de un jugador que, está, que, que a lo mejor tiene potencial para el profesional, pero maybe not there yet, um, and he wants to take a detour and still continue his, his career later on. I think the NCAA, it's, it's, a, it's an institution that is going through a lot of changes right now, right? I think if we talk in two years, it's going to look very differently, very, very different. Uh, there, there's a lot of rules around athletes' compensation, right, uh, yeah. uh, that yeah. are being discussed. Uh, the reality of that situation, though, is that discussion is mainly on football and, 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 and basketball. Basketball, yeah. That's, that's yeah. really where, where it matters, you know? Uh, on the soccer side of things, it's not as relevant, those rules, um, you know, because there, there's no that star power. Unless, with the exception of Dana, for example, for the past five years, Dana has been, uh, which is funny how it works, right? But if you see that uh, it, for the past four years, while Dana Castellanos was in college, she was the biggest star in, an, in the NCAA by far. I mean, you, you, here you have an athlete that has, Uh, 1.2 million followers in social media. She's only 17, 18 years old. She's already nominated as being one of the best players in the world. Uh, and yet the attention is not the attention that March Madness players receive, right? Or that Big 12 or uh, SEC football players receive as well. So um, with that said, I, I do think that there's going to be some opportunities for international student athletes. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty to do right now because of COVID and, you know, people don't even know they're going to be, you know, playing football, soccer, you know, th th this next season. Uh, that, you know, when you put that together with, um, you know, even government rules, right? Uh, there's a lot of countries right now that have a lot of restrictions. Uh, even the, our own government right now in the States is putting a lot of restrictions to international student athletes. So it, it's just the landscape is changing dr drastically. So... We'll see how that comes out. Yeah, I mean, I know with the NCAA, there's a lot of changes, but this is, I mean, sports ahorita in general, there's a lot of changes. I mean, of course, yeah. as we know, you're probably dealing this with all your, all your, all your athletes, right? With the, the COVID, um, there's been a lot of delays, a lot of, you know, I don't know what's going on with contracts, so there's been rework with contracts, but okay. we're starting to see it open now. Um, you know, what, what, what do you understand the current state of, of sports, especially in soccer ahorita? Con lo que está pasando con COVID, do you see that we're we're you're, we're we're gearing towards it finally opening, or you think there's you know what there's a chance that it can be shut down again? What are your thoughts? You know, I'll, I'll start with the one positive, and I, because I've had the discussion for the past two months nonstop. The one positive is everybody is in the same boat. You know, we're, it, it, there's it doesn't matter if you are in the Mexican league, 
Spanish league, France league, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a player, you know, in any of those leagues, or if you're an executive, everybody's going to the same thing. Uh, with that said, um, leagues have managed their contracts and, and their consequences differently, and we're seeing it from the inside. You know, in Spain, for example, players, there's what they call ERTE, right? And that means, like, um, there's a reason for the, for, the, for the country to declare, like, a state of emergency. So any company, right, included soccer clubs, uh, can declare for this edited thing, which is like the government now pays part of the salary to their employees, which is what happened in, in you know, let's say Atletico de Madrid, which we have three players, Charlene, Dana, and Kenti Robles. Um, you know, part of that salary is being covered by the Spanish government. Uh, that doesn't happen in Mexico. You know, there's some clubs that uh, lower salaries just, just because they wanted to lower salaries, right? Or just because they didn't know the scope or magnitude uh, of the financial stress that they were going to navigate. Um, I think we're right in, in that transition of clubs know they're going to get hit. They still don't know how much. And because of that, there, there are a lot of budget constraints, which obviously makes sense, right? You, you mitigate costs. There are the summer window, you know, in terms of transfers and signings, it's pretty much going to be just a wash. You know, there, there's not, there's not going to be any big, big, big contracts. Um, players and agents like myself were in the worst position ever to negotiate because it's, it's pretty much whatever you give me, you know, my instruction to the player is, Take it because you could be out of a job. I mean, we're yeah. not, we, we have no leverage whatsoever in, in the negotiation. Um, and, and it's not that I can fight it. It's, it's me fighting or putting a, you know, a big stand could, could mean, uh, that the player will be without a contract, right? So as I see it, and I discussed this with, with many colleagues and, and brands and, and, and just clubs in general, I don't see this being uh, we're not going to go back to normal in the next year. I think it's going to take two, two years to really, really go back to normal. Uh, we might not even be back to normal. It might be a new normal, right? And I know we've heard this in every industry that, that, that you know, that, that we can talk about. But in soccer, I do think there's going to be a new normal uh, in terms of contracts, in terms of transfer fees. Um, the women's soccer landscape uh, is going to get affected. How much will remain to be seen? Um, what we do know, it's gonna slow the it's gonna slow the the growth. That's a fact, and we are already seeing that. So yeah, which is kind of a it's kind of you know down you know bad to see because he's, he you know, he started seeing maybe you guys can back me up on this guys Ivan and said he always started seeing that momentum build up right more interest yeah. towards women's soccer. I mean, yeah. we always hear the women's, the women's, the U.S. women's soccer team being the lead and them getting all the, all the head time. But us being Mexicanos and supporting their three, we want to see a, a women's, you know, Mexico soccer team to like also start dominating and compete against the women's U.S. We were we were hooked on the U17 run that these girls did. Uh, was it a year yeah. ago? I mean, yeah. my son was was just like amazed. He was hooked on TV. He wanted to know what time the next games were. Uh, <laughs> I, I really think. Um, you know, the, the women's game is attractive. Um, and, yeah. and, and my son was all over it, you know, and, he, and he's a huge fan of soccer in general and he yeah. just loved it. And we were hooked because the girls were winners. And I think yeah, that's can, the change, right? Like as these girls get better, as investment gets better and they start winning, oh, the yeah. fans naturally just come. It's going to blow up. And I think what, how, what other best, what are, you know, way to do it than having a U.S. Mexico rivalry in the women's as well, right? Oh, I mean, that's just going to blow up and nice. we have to get them, right, Evan? Yeah, that would be amazing, dude. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, you can even see from our members. I mean, Chico, he's hooked, dude. He's a big Chadlene fan. I think he even talks to her from time to time and messages her here and there. I mean, baby. What's that? What's that? Oh yeah, she almost dropped. He almost dropped the baby with her, right? Or something happened there. <laughs> he was so excited. He like this, and he almost dropped the baby trying to say hi to Chadlene. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, like, Chadlene is top class as a person and as a player. Yeah, dude, we're definitely seeing that. We're seeing the love, and it, it's it's a bummer that it's gonna slow down the growth. But you know what? I'd be when things get back, I, I can see it continue to grow, especially from our our, our fan base, right? That we definitely want to see them succeed. Is that here, well, you like, say something? Yeah, like I think I think you know one thing I've been talking to Guillermo about before uh, before this conversation. You just talked in general was we want to get PVA out to at least one game, like in a big mass, the way we do for the men's. Uh, yeah. so I, and we just need to figure out how to do that. Um, you know, as soon 
once things get back going and everything, we just got we've got to hook into that and, and start making those a priority as well, not just the men. Because yeah. um, yeah. I honestly think there's more leeway to to have more fun at at, at the women's games. Uh, I think the environment's gonna be a lot cooler. Um, and there's just so many options to go and have a really good time in some of these other cities that the men, frankly, don't go to, um, you know, so I think it's, it, it, it's something we really need to like buckle down as PVA leaders, you and me, you know, I've been rich and sit down and really say, all right, we're going to commit to this game at this location. And we're all going to go as much as possible. Yeah, uh, man. To make it a party out of it. Cause we all know that whether it's men or women playing, um, it just depends about us and how, how cool of a part we make it. Yeah. It's bringing yeah. it back to our roots and our culture. Right. I, I've been, um, I have a question exactly. for Ivan to follow up, though. Ivan, you know, you, we're all super fans, but Ivan, you are a super fan of Tolo, right? You know, you're 49ers, you're, you're Dodgers. You're just hearing Guillermo talking about the new normal, dude, there's that potential, man, Ivan, that you as a fan are not going to have the same experience in the next year or two that you had in the past. How does that make you feel, thinking that, you know, I might not might not be the, the tailgate or have the ability to be around a lot of people. Might be some 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 rules that are going to limit that interaction. Yeah. How does that make you feel, dude? A couple of years? I don't know, man. How does that well, make you man? I try to always look at the positive side of things. Um, for one, I want everybody to be healthy, specifically with this COVID-19 that's going around pandemic. But it's going to give me a perspective as in just seeing the games as well as more of a fan at home. I Don't I, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Don't get, I, I love like going out, meeting people because I was – this close to getting credentials for the 49ers like as a like as a writer and they were probably going to do that in spanish but now because of this COVID 19 it's probably not going to happen it's probably going to happen next season anyways i think it's just taking things in perspective and seeing it in a different manner because for the past few years obviously within my budget i go to the games i get to meet people um i get to do the stadium tours um it just i think it kind of puts everything on hold for a minute. And maybe yeah. I, I'm looking at things from the outside looking in to see how we can improve er, and everything that we do, not just in football, but even for Bunch of Bears Army, um, for the Dodgers group. Um, it kind of puts everything on pause so we could kind of see how we can improve. So that's how I look at it. Like I know well, it's I think, because, you know, yeah, like you may- we can grow certain ways because everything is on hold, but we can kind of plan a little bit more now. To use yeah. our time a little bit more wisely, so when we come back, we already know what we're gonna do. You made a good point, man. I think we have to we have to adjust and find you know within our means what, how we can continue to make this an experience, right? The yeah. true fans will find a way. The I mean, even Guillermo is another example. Do you see a gap? You see everything. Everything you should see it as an opportunity. You know, yeah. who's gonna be the first team? Who's gonna be the first league to take this new normal? and take it to that next level, right? I mean, Germany was the first to kick off in, in a lot of other, yeah. other countries. We're watching them, but we shouldn't be just watching them. We should watch them to learn, but we should also be going, okay, what are they doing that I can see? Like, I already, I've seen the match. I'm like, dude, it's boring watching the games with no audio. Like, I'll, especially it's the commentators. Different. If you have, the Mexico, the Mexico commentators are the best, bro, because those guys have fashion, you know. Like, you're like, yeah. yeah. But these, some of the, like, it's like watching golf. Watching golf and soccer, I'm just like, dude, how, dude, this is this guy's boring as crap, right? <laughs> you, you said the key word, and, and, and I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't touched on this. It's opportunity, right? Um, and and I think we take that opportunity word and, and build it into um, being part of the conversation, right? And one of the things that we've always, you know, harped on is, as PVA is following the rules, being respectful of the host um, hosting these events. Um, and because of that, I think we have a great platform to be part of the conversation of what soccer looks like for the Mexican national team when it comes back into the U S right. Is it going to be limited fans? Well, maybe, maybe those limited fans includes PVA because PVA behaves itself because PVA brings, you know, the, the passion because PVA brings the music, all, the um, all, all that stuff. Right. So, it, you know, it's, it, it's an opportunity um, to be part of that discussion. And honestly, I'm very happy that we've been able to keep our membership um, in line yeah. with the rules and procedures at these stadiums and these people host uh, these events. Because now we get to be part of that discussion moving forward. Um, and yeah. in this environment, that's going to be big because that will give us access to those games, hopefully. Yeah. 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 yeah get, I get, that's get, like the key part where we can kind of use this to kind of regroup and then see where we can, like, I don't want to say make mistakes, but where we can improve because there's always room for improvement. And todo lo que hacemos en la vida, 
siempre hay como espacio para mejorar en todos en todos los aspectos. Claro, claro. Guillermo, tú, tú has tenido la oportunidad de ver esos partidos ahorita que están jugando en los países que están abriendo su, sus ligas, ¿verdad? Uh, ¿Qué oportunidades usted estás viendo ahorita de, de you know, ¿qué oportunidades ves ahorita? You know, that they're lacking, you know, areas that you're like, okay, this is great, you know, it's, it's okay, but I can, you can do better. Is there anything that you see that, you know what, this, they're definitely missing the ball? That's a great question. So I think uh, BR, I mean, BR is just going to accelerate it. You know, I think it, it's, it's already coming. Um, I can see in the next couple of years uh, having a BR system where you as a fan, instead of going to the actual stadium, you know, you're sitting here with your BR system and you're actually seeing everything around, uh, you know, the stadium. Uh, you know, wow. in Russia, I, I, I remember walking Um, you know, the, the FIFA Media Center, Operational Center, and uh, they had VR equipment already there. You know, and it, it, there were certain countries that already had access to that. And wow. it's really a big thing right here. And you put it in, you put in, and you're in the stadium, literally. Like you're, you can, with, with some buttons, you're actually walking inside the stadium. Uh, and it's unreal. So how, how do we scale that? I think that's a big question. I think the NBA, yeah. a lot of that going on. And, might be easier for them. Uh, but I just think that's going to get accelerated. Um, yeah. I, there's a lot Especially of... Right now. The, to the environment, right? The, like you said, it's boring. It's, it's boring. So how do you make that a little bit more entertaining? Um, I see a lot of leagues using like the EA sound system or whatever. Um, you know, I, <laughs> so I'm okay. And sometimes I watch soccer just in mute, literally. So I'm just watching the action. Uh, so that's, that's because I'm in the computer too, right? So I'm not like... Multitasking, yeah. Exactly. But when it comes to the big games, I do prefer to watch it on, t on television. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there that, um, and to, to your point earlier, whoever takes advantage of it, uh, whoever takes that uh, opportunity is going to be in a, in a better competitive stage. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so to clarify, Guillermo, you said VR, not VAR, right? Because Sergio, we know how he feels about the VAR, right? Not, you said V. There's, there's Sergio. an opportunity in VAR, too, but not <laughs> virtual reality. Okay, cool. Because I, I saw Sergio kind of cringing and his eyes were twitching a little bit when you said yeah, VAR. Bar. I was like, it's, it's VAR, not VA, not it's a v, VR, yeah, virtual yeah. reality. Yeah, VAR is as useful as the NFL referees in big games. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, uh, yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's, this is what I like about, you know, I think it's accelerating, um, you know, technology as well. It's, like te it, it, it's going to accelerate a lot of sports and a lot of the, a lot of things, a lot of, um, you know, executives or player uh, owners were hesitant. I think they even have no choice. You got to try these things now. Right? Yeah. Get the fans engaged because before the engagement was you go like you go to the game, you pregame with people at a bar or a restaurant, however, with your family. And you go to the game after the game, but now it's kind of like everybody's at home. What's like the next step? How are you going to interact with people? I mean, yeah. you can have viewing parties together or get together with friends, but it's not the same as in going to the game and interacting there. Okay. So I think that's where. Yeah. Like, but again, dude, it's, it's, it's that, you know, the money piece, man. It's going to, you know, two years, if that's what it takes, dude, that's a lot of revenue lost. You know, people not going yeah. to the games. And um, I'm thinking about, for example, you know, watching. You know, going back to the the football. I know you know, we're talking about soccer, but football. Look at XFL. Was it XFL that you know tried to do this crazy things where they had the cameras on on the oh, field, yeah. and then eventually the NFL embraced a lot of that stuff. You know, they saw mm -hmm. that that you know the XFL crashed. It didn't it was garbage. It didn't work. But actually, but, you know what? There was a lot of positive that came out of that. You know, the the sky cam and all these things that people saw those things and implemented to enhance the product. So. Yeah. I think also, I think, um, you know, the figures that, that I mentioned, I, I think that's going to be from a financial perspective. I definitely see fans going back to stadiums, hopefully next year, right? Uh, even for you guys, like, in that scenario, uh, you're going to have a lot of games, right? Because, I mean, I don't know. A lot of making up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not with Zoom anymore, but uh, I, I do know they have, you know, big contracts with brands. So they're going to have to figure it out how to put 10 games in one year. On top moly, of moly. exactly, exactly. On top of save your money, guys. Save your money. You know, and your livers, your livers. <laughs> oh my God! And Gold Cup, it, it could be a uh, and the Olympics, right? And yeah. the Olympics, exactly. And the Olympics got pushed for next year. Was hopefully yeah, for you know, next year. Could yeah. be the easiest year for PBA for sure. Yeah. 
and, and you know, I, I was thinking to your about livers, that, yeah. and, and and I was thinking about this when it happened, and you know, a bunch of the sports were put on pause or like delayed for a second. How everybody's gonna be like for this year, including the NFL, everybody is gonna be competing for TV time. Like yeah. soccer is coming back already, MLS, Liga MX is coming back, NBA is back, yeah. football is coming back. I mean, in August and September. Um, I mean, baseball is up in hiatus, but everybody's going to be competing for TV time. And I know they're going to lose. I think I read that MLS is going to lose one billion dollars because of what happened right now. But this is where like they have to capitalize with like TV and how they're going to get the fans engaged. And then next year, like what's going to happen next year? When are they going to allow fans? Because the NFL, like the Niners, they're still charging me, even LAFC. They were still charging us for season tickets, and we're not going to be able to see, like, the game. And the NFL, doesn't, NFL is going as in they're going to allow fans. Like, they've been telling us, they've been sending, sending us emails for group tickets, but we don't even know if we're going to be allowed into the stadiums. Yeah. I don't know how, like, what's going to happen with that, too. Yeah, that's interesting, man. That they're still trying to collab. I mean, again, I think it's like every everything else, right? There's still a lot of unknowns of what's to come, but dude, I mean, just the fact I think recent, you know, there's been a spike of, of the virus hitting again. So could yeah. that potentially shut things back again? We don't know, man. There's a lot of unknowns, and this is why it's such a volatile um, situation for sports. But you know, we got to think positive, man. We got to always think That's ahead. We always do. We got to we got to allow those people to think ahead and keep us engaged and and keep it going, man. I mean. I, I think a lot of good stuff are going to come out of this at the end. We're going to end up enhancing the me sport. Too. So yeah. we're going from COVID. I have a question for Guillermo that's really been bugging me a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, well, not bugging me, but like I've been really interested in um, Masha Clan, right? The new yeah. Liga MX team. Um, it, it just feels more MLS in their fan yeah. engagement, right? Like like their their marketing, their their what they're putting out there. Um, it's in Spanish, obviously, but it just feels more MLS. Do you get that feeling as well? That Liga MX is turning MLS. No, no, well, that team, that team is operating on, on like a on a American MLS style business model, right? Like it feels yeah, yeah. It has a different. It just has a different feel to it. Yeah, I think the, so. The way I see that is the branding is. Uh, I definitely, I definitely like the, the branding. I think the tone, the tone in social media was interesting, right? But that's something that. So they sell. I mean, that, that's a fact, right? And uh, I've always said to my team in the agency is we don't have to fully agree with it. We don't have to fully understand it, maybe, but we have to see the data, right? And data shows that that kind of tone is going to create impressions, is going to create engagement, and it can ultimately drive revenue, right? So from an executive perspective, that's how you have to look at that, right? Now, I'm very curious how they execute, uh, you know, take it to your point, how they execute now, uh, you know, on field, in stadium, uh, you know, closer to games. Uh, obviously, there's a, that, that competitive factor, too, in the team. Like, you have to also perform at a certain level on the field for that, you know, impact to really cross um, the field. So, but, yeah, I can definitely see that from a marketing perspective. I mean, I, when I think MLS, I think marketing. You know, their genius is at it. Uh, for many different angles and for many different reasons. Um, and I, I think Mazatlan has started really strong from that perspective. So I can definitely see that connection with MLS. Yeah, but I think they definitely have to do that because some of the things that's been coming up, right? And this is um, an argument against Mazatlan moving there is that they're a baseball town or they're a baseball. Yeah. You yeah. Know, that, so they have to start, you know, is there soccer fans? Is there? Yeah, there probably is, right? Because, but it's known for a baseball town. So they're going to have to take that stigma right that 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 perception that that's a baseball town and really and, and prove them wrong right so that's yeah. that they have an uphill battle and you know I'm, I'm curious it could be it could be a case study for future soccer um soccer clubs in the future right how they overcome that so yeah it's it's like that for a couple i think sinaloa they're more of a baseball town um yeah the, a lot of the north uh, of the teams yeah 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 a bunch of those mexican uh, baseball teams they're pretty powerful like not powerful but they're pretty popular yeah. Where people would yeah. rather attend the baseball games than the football game. Yeah. I think that's like yeah. super. So I'm curious. I'm curious to see how it's gonna yeah, go, especially with the with the COVID thing too. I don't know how that's gonna happen. I want. I want to go to my. I just catch an America. <laughs> All right, and the interview is over. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, 
Cool. This is a good conversation, man. I like that we're talking about, you know, current state, but, you know, let's talk about your shirt for a second, Guillermo. I really like yes. that, man. Did, yeah, is that something fine. recent? Like, did that that has been catching my attention the whole time because it's relevant, man. It's just topical. This is our, our world right now. Um, I think that, you know, we have to I, – I feel that it's, you know what, it's a long time coming. I mean, we've had so much tension and so much um, so much in our country that this this has accelerated, and I think we need to have this kind of conversation. We need to put our – our leaders on in check and get, Hey, we, we need to start t- having this dialogue. We need to take care uh, of this inequality that's going on. So let me, tell me about that shirt. How'd you end up getting that shirt? So this was a very cool tip from, from FIFA. I don't know if you guys seen some players wearing it uh, this past week. Um, so it was just, a, a, it's a gay fun. And when I saw it, I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to wear this as often as I can the next couple of weeks, because it is something that, you know, it's, it's relevant. It's important. Uh, I think it's time. Uh, so even us from an agency perspective, I mean, we have a very small platform, right? But we're trying to use it. Um, and I'm very interesting. Uh, I'm very interested to see how athletes in general use their platforms because, you know, you see LeBron James, you know, making a big, big stand. Uh, people sometimes don't realize those kind of athletes are more, more influential than, you know, any governor, maybe some of the presidents of different countries. They are <laughs> big. Yeah. So seeing them take that stand, uh, it's unbelievable, and, and I'm very much looking forward to it. That's that true. is that is awesome, man. Yeah, I, I totally agree one with of you. Those shirts. I'm gonna look for it <laughs> online and see if I can buy it. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, I, I I obviously from my hat, you can tell I'm a Mexico fan and a UT fan, and our players, you know, came out with a huge list of demands recently. I think like three four days ago, um, you know, on this same platform asking for. For for you know Black Lives Matter donations, asking for renaming of statues or yeah. I mean, buildings, asking yeah. for tearing down Confederate statues on campus, yeah. uh, you know, lots of demands, and they're using their platform positively to impact their community. So I think I think you're going to see a lot of that, you know, uh, from from a lot of these players, and that's a good thing. I, I yeah. totally agree with it. Well, it reminds me of I mean, we've been talking about the documentary of The Last Dance, right? There was um, I forgot what episode it was, but where Jordan was criticized why he wasn't you know, supporting a I think it was a North Carolina senator or House of Representative. Right. He wasn't getting involved. And, and, and he didn't realize, dude, I mean, at that point, you know, that he had a big say. So people were expecting this from him. And I think yeah. back then it wasn't as relevant as now. And I think maybe like LeBron James and all that see the impact that they have. And yeah. that's why they're, they're speaking up. And it's a big responsibility, man. I can imagine you, you know, representing a lot of these players. It, it can't be easy for them because what they're doing is they're putting themselves out there. Uh, because what that does now, it, it puts, you know, I mean, social media, you're going to get, you're going to get people on Twitter that are going to start to comment on things and say things. Are you ready to handle those kind of, um, those comments? You know, yeah. you've, you've been known as somebody that people love and you're getting a bunch of praise, but you're going to get some, some criticism now. Yeah. Right. So how do you handle things, that with your, um, with your, go ahead, Ivan. Got a couple of things that when you said that Jordan, he did make that comment where he kind of stood in a neutral way and he made that comment where while well, Republicans buy my shoes too. But I mean, he, I don't think he realized like the impact he had yet um, with that. But yeah, that's the only thing I yeah. kind of had to yeah, say. Yeah, well, how do you how do you how do you do that with your players now? Because you're representing them now. Um, how do you see that conversation going with them, and how are they taking? It? Is it is it is it stressful for? Is it a lot for them on their shoulders? What are your thoughts? So I think it depends uh, on the athlete, their country, their background. You know, there's definitely not a. Uh, one perfect formula, right? You have to evaluate each case uh, on a case-by-case basis. Uh, I think what we've seen the past few weeks is that line, right? So, I mean, this shouldn't be a discussion, period, right? And I think that's where a lot of athletes are starting to draw the line a lot of figures, you know, or entertainment or, or not entertainment, just in general. Um, and they're starting to use that, that voice. Um, there's no doubt that as a player, um, that you, you're going to have, you have fans from all spectrums of life, right? Different mentalities, different political views. Yeah. So there is no way you're going to please every single athlete unless you keep quiet like many athletes do. And I, I understand that logic. You know, we, we also have to see whether that athlete depends on, uh, you know, commercializing their fan base from X, Y, or C different reasons, right? There's that aspect to it, you know. There's the aspect of obviously an NFL player versus MLB versus NWSL versus you know a league in in, in Europe uh, on the on the women's side. 
a lot of those players might depend more on their fan base than some of these big stars. So now, with that said, a lot of these big stars, even though they might not care on the, on the financial piece, they still get <laughs> scrutinized and criticized way harder uh, if they say X or Y. So it, it's definitely not easy you know, for, for any athlete around the world right now. Uh, but I've been very pleased to see that a lot of those athletes are drawing the line and saying, okay, this is it. This is yeah. the one thing that we're not going to tolerate. And it's been yeah. interesting to see that. Yeah, you yeah. Gotta, and I, respect I, that. I think it's, it's tough on an athlete. Um, like you said, they have a huge platform and they're probably more of an influence than uh, like even Governor Newsom. But uh, we have to understand too, I think it's tough because even Ka- Colin Kaepernick, like where he was peacefully protesting for everything that yeah. happened and he kind of got blackballed by the NFL. And now everybody's picking up on it. And now the commissioner said, I apologize. Even um, uh, head coach from Seattle, Pete Carroll, was like, oh, I regret not signing him. And give him a con, sign him now. I mean, he's still better than more than half the quarterbacks that are backups in the league. But yeah. it's like we say, it's better to, you know how the NFL is donating, I think, $250 million or $150 million to help everybody educate with this racism and everything that's going on. I think it's better to be proactive leading the way instead of reacting after everything yeah. happens, which the NHL should have done way back. I, 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 and, and it says a lot. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Guillermo. Go ahead, Guillermo. Finish, finish, finish up. And it just says a lot, I think, I think, because I, I, the NFL is my favorite sport. I love football. My heart belongs to the 49ers. But I think it says a lot that a lot of these uh, NFL owners haven't said a single thing, specifically Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, because he's always commenting. He's very outspoken. He's yeah. everywhere. Every, and this, he's nothing he hasn't said anything anything and that really really bothers me it kind of yeah. like makes me not appreciate that if i was much as I have in the past. about his voice yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> sorry sorry no, <laughs> but, sorry Guillermo, thank you no 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 lo que iba a decir es que okay, hay una, y hay una parte que, que también nos estamos olvidando es muchas veces eh, la gente no, no, no se da cuenta que para que un atleta saque un statement una oración you know, haciendo un stand o otro se requiere de un equipo capaz detrás de ese atleta. El atleta es experto en comunicación. El, experto, el atleta no es experto en cómo manejar una crisis de esta magnitud. And what you say matters, right? So, cu- cuando lo empiezas a poner en papel, es mucho más difícil de lo que la gente piensa que es. Entonces, creo que sí, depende de darte un poco las diferencias de los atletas. Por ejemplo, Drew Brees, que sí, cometió un error. Pero, ¿cómo...? Uf. Dio el, 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 ese error y cómo lo volteó dos, tres días después. Ese no es Drew Brees. Ese es un equipo de PR con, con, con un talento increíble que supo poner todas las piezas. O sea, eso no es fácil. Es como muchas veces piensa que es que es Drew Brees. Dijo, no, o sea, sí, él fue el que cometió el error, pero quien lo regresó es su equipo de PR. Entonces, claro. muchos yeah. no tienen ese equipo detrás para poder realmente ser eficientes y efectivos en la comunicación. Bueno, well, sí. to, to go to Guillermo's point, um, and, and kind of, you know, one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of Guillermo is um, you see some of these brands making statements with, and you can, you just know there's no diversity in that room yeah. when they're making these statements. Um, and so when you look at an agency like, you know, the marketing jersey, and you see this diversity, not only of, uh, of people, but of nationalities, different countries, you know, the, the way a, a Mexican American or the way a Mexican or the way a Venezuelan thinks about a topic is totally different. And you see this diversity in his room, um, you know that the statement was put through different lenses before it came out. Um, and, and, and honestly, you don't see that in some of these statements from these companies or brands um, that they're making. You're just like, it's a little tone deaf. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, that, that's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of Yeno because he's actually promoting diversity um, within his players, within his, within his companies, within his, you know, his structure. And I think that's yeah. important. That's a good call out, Sergio. I, I noticed too that, um, you know, part of his team, I think I just recently I saw at the beginning of this year, was Weasel, right? You guys have Weasel in your team, so I know that guy's from another planet. So the fact that you got an alien, someone that's out of this world, uh, is pretty impressive. So you know, not only are you meeting the people from planet Earth, but whatever you know planet Weasel's from, he, you're you're attracting out out of the galaxy. That's pretty awesome. So it's from TikTok. <laughs> yeah, his TikToks are something else. So, yeah, uh, Guillermo, dude, this is. I mean, uh, thank you for for taking the time to talk. I mean, this has been. You know, probably one of the the most engaged. I mean, I would say most interesting hours I've had. Yeah, um, we've had so many good topics, but I think you, you really got enlightened with you know current topics, current situations, um, getting to know your journey. Um, nuestros, you know, nuestros miembros de PVA, 
tiene la oportunidad de, de ver que hey, hay, muchos, hay muchas plataformas, hay muchas avenidas que puedes tomar desde los jóvenes hasta ahorita, you know, lo que podemos hacer como fanáticos, um, take advantage of this opportunity, what is going on, just being informed and having conversations um, is super important. So, um, thank yeah. you for your time, man. I always like to say any questions. Oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, oh, oh, no, we're over time, Sergio. Sorry, man. You should have asked <laughs> earlier. No, go ahead. Dude. Go ahead. No, no, you know, as we talk about being more engaged and being more socially conscious, I want to ask Guillermo, you know, what, what is his advice to us as fans to help promote and, yeah. and football in Mexico? You know, we all want those champions, but they just don't, they're just not, you know, coming off the trees. How do we help Football Femini, what does he recommend we can do as an organization um, to, to promote that? Uh, great question. So I think, uh, I mean, there's different ways. Definitely tuning in, you know, there's not every club, not every league shows the games, unfortunately. Right? We're still in that stage. Um, but when they do, definitely, you know, tuning in, that helps. You know, a lot of the clubs are TV right holder driven, right, in, in terms of whatever they generate from TV rights they invest into the teams. So if they don't receive, you know, the, the, that money, it's hard for them to justify a bigger investment in women's soccer. That's a fact. Um, you know, when you start seeing things in Europe that are happening, you know, when you start commercializing TV rights at a league level, and then you see that money start falling down different clubs, which signifies bigger investment, bigger signings, uh, and, be and better conditions, honestly, for players, right? And that's, uh, that's really what the women's soccer players right now are fighting. Just, they're not asking for millions. They're asking just for a salary that uh, it's enough for them to just focus 100% of their, their attention to playing the sport. Um, that doesn't happen, unfortunately, um, it doesn't happen in Mexico. It happens in most of the clubs in Spain, but it doesn't happen in 100% of, of, of those clubs. If you look at Spain, for example, you're talking about a league that is has 10, 15 years more than the Mexican the Mexican soccer league, right? And they're still not at that point. So that just gives you some perspective in terms of how how really behind uh, you know women's soccer in general truly is. Um, you know, supporting players, following players, demanding brands to really put attention into the into the game. So I think that's a big 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 puzzle. You know, big part of the puzzle too is these brands they need to start. They need to stop seeing women's soccer as a social cost. It is not a social cost. It is an investment. It is a platform. It is a property that will give you ROI if you care enough. And if you actually have decision makers that will look at the bigger picture, would understand the stories behind the players, would understand what women's soccer in general gives you, and then you could put a strategy and some tactics into it to really get, you know, take advantage of your sponsorship. But that's what I see a lot of the times is, um, you know, the decision makers still at a brand level, they don't see the, the, the value of it. And then they take the safe route, right? Which is just put money into the men's sport and that's it. So I can go on and on on this topic because it's, it's something oh. to live. Well, the number one thing is we should do is we should become more engaged as fans. We should yeah. follow these players mm -hmm. on social media. We should look at their games when we can. Uh, if the Mexican women national team is playing on TV, we should watch it. Um, yeah. If they're playing near us, we should go. And I think I think I speak for for most of us, uh, V. And you tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Let's try to commit, man, to to a game in the next you know year or so when things yeah. kind of open up again and commit to a game and let's do it. Let's go to one of these games and go in mass and and, and bring some atmosphere there. Well, I mean, I think I think you know it's like ratings, fa fan base says it all, right? I mean, that's just gonna bring attention. You know, that's gonna open up the eyes of these investors. And, and, and long term, I love what Guillermo said. You know, long term is that what's going to happen is a lot of these players are going to retire. They, if, they, if they are, you know, have a good living, they're going to then invest in the women's. They're going to put money yeah. towards it, right? Because they've experienced, look at all the men's, right? All the, all the men athletes who, who have finished and they become either, you know, coaches, they invest into the teams, they're these big paying. names. Yep. You start to see that. So if we can invest in them now, they're going to be the future that's going to drive it even more. It shouldn't be all in them. It should be on all of us. Yep. But I can see that happening, dude, because I think that that's something that, you know, it's going to be around. And I think it's a big it's a big opportunity. And, and whoever's not jumping on that is missing, missing the boat. Guillermo, how do I buy a Dana uh, jersey for my son? Uh, online. Those, yeah. those from Atlético Madrid, they have a big operation. Fanatics actually manages the store. So, you oh, so Atlético Madrid has a U.S. store that we can buy from? Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. I will buy one tonight. There you go. <laughs> 
There you go. It starts there, man. I'm going to need to let it. It starts there, bro. It starts there. It starts there. Supporting them, getting them, promoting it, take, you know, just really following them, man. So, but, you know, um, Guillermo, um, any final thoughts, any final things you want to say uh, to our fans, to people watching us? What What are your final thoughts? No, digo, realmente, digo, fuera de, de los tópicos, gracias por, por la invitación. Eh, digo, también complementarlos a ustedes por, por el trabajo que hacen para la comunidad de, de mexicanos aquí en Estados Unidos, independientemente si son de primera generación como, como yo, de segunda ter generación, tercera generación, independientemente si hablan español, inglés, Spanglish, code switching, uh, lo que están haciendo ustedes y lo que han hecho a lo largo de los años es increíble. Yo se lo he dicho a Sergio mil veces, eh, soy, soy fan digo, de verlos en los estadios cuando estuve en Zoom el año pasado, igual verlos en todos los, eh, en todos los eventos eh, las, las marcas buscándolos a ustedes para poder conectar con su fanbase eh, lo que hacen con las adelitas o sea, realmente es algo único y, y digo, sé que hay por ahí algunos otros grupos que intentan replicar lo que ustedes están haciendo pero cuando, cuando pienso en, en Mexican Soccer y en Mexican Soccer Fanbase pienso en Villas Army, y eso es algo que ustedes han construido y que tiene muchísimo mérito y que, bueno, que es más allá de solamente la conexión del fútbol, ¿no? O sea, es, una, es una comunidad eh, del mexicoamericano y eso para mí es, es muy refrescante verlo. Eh, y repito, aunque soy de primera generación, el verlo y, y ver sus, las historias de sus miembros es increíble. So, I would just, you know, commend that and keep, keep, keep doing that work because it's, it's pretty amazing. Gracias, gracias, Guillermo. Iván, any final thoughts? Uh, uh, Guillermo, placer conocerte, mucho gusto. Uh, también Sergio, thank you for everything you've done for this PBA thing. It's been pretty cool. Um, ever since I got in back in what 2000, and it's been a while. Um, I've enjoyed it every step of the way. I loved every bit of it. The fun, the tough time, and everything. It's super fun. Z, good job with the podcast once again, and hoping that everything kind of gets back as normal and we stay healthy with this COVID-19 thing. Because man, I miss sports so much. <laughs> and we got to we, we do have to emphasize a little bit more with the feminine sports as well. Yeah, awesome, man. Gracias, Ivan. Uh, Sergio, final thoughts, últimos comentarios. Guillermo, thank you for your time, man. I know you're busy, and, and it's, it's awesome to meet you here on, on this platform and let everybody else meet you. So, muchas gracias por estar con nosotros hoy. Uh, Ivan, love you, brother. You know that. Uh, whatever you need, anywhere, anytime, you know I'm there. And uh, Z, man, you do a fantastic job on this, man. And then thank you for telling the story not just of PVA, but of the fans and why the fans love soccer and why the fans follow the Mexican national team. So thank you so much for all that. And, and thank all you guys. Awesome, man. Thank you guys. So Guillermo, I can't say it again. Thank you for taking the time. Muchas gracias por uh, con, comunicarse con, nos, con nosotros y hablar de tu histori historia. Um, you know, primeramente, you know, let's all, let's all remember. I'm from, from a beautiful culture. You know, Mexico is dear to our heart, whether we're first, second, third generation, like Guillermo said. Um, you know, myself, I was born there, but I was raised in the U.S. You know, a lot of us can relate to either one of those spectrums. Let's not, you know, let's not put each other down, man. That's the biggest thing about our, our, our yeah. cultura is that when somebody sees success, man, let's, let's you know what, let's, let's celebrate that success of, of our of our fellow members, of our nuestra, nuestra, nuestra raza. You know, hey, que bueno, échale ganas, keep going well. So right now what I'm saying, Guillermo, échale, síguele, you know, keep doing what you're doing, man. We're proud of you. Just like we're proud of all of our members, what everybody's doing. Um, and, and again, you know, from, from Arizona, all the way from California, from Texas, and from Seti Hills Daycare, thank you guys for uh, taking the time to uh, talk to us today, and we'll see you guys next time in VS Podcast. Have a good one, everybody. Hey, bro. Awesome. Yo he cantar esta canción, yo para mi gente. Con una pasión. Cool. Right, pues. Thank you guys. Have a good weekend. Hey, if I don't see you guys, then he'll happy Father's Day next weekend. Oh, yeah. You bro. All right, man. Oh, that's right. Be Take safe, care. everybody. Oh. Bye, Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.